I knew I was a drug addict. I knew I was an alcoholic. And I knew I was an armed robber and a pillion. You know Danny Trejo. You will turn around. You will leave my shop because I never want to hear my brother's name mentioned again. If it isn't from Spy Kids, it's from Machete. Is there another way out of here? If it isn't from Machete, it's probably from Anaconda. Honestly, we could do this all day long because that's how deep his catalog is with more than 400 acting credits to his name. But this is Danny Trejo as you've never seen him before. For the very first time in his decades long career, the 77 year old is giving us an in-depth look into his past in his book, Trejo, My Life of Crime, Redemption and Hollywood. Way before the fame, the book starts by illustrating his unbelievable beginnings growing up in Los Angeles, California. What do you remember about that time? Looking back, I mean, it's nothing short of miraculous that you're here to tell this story. At one time, my life ambition was to be the, the lightweight and welterweight champion of San Quentin. Mm. I never thought I was getting out of prison. Danny says the men in his family were in and out of prison for, you name it. And that's exactly where Trejo thought he'd spend the rest of his life. One thing that's very interesting about your, your story is how you were not really raised by your parents. What kind of impact did it have on you? I had one uncle, my uncle Gilbert, who, who just was like more my age and kind of almost became my big brother. Me and him just gravitated toward each other. And that was my role model. It just happened, you know, he was a drug addict and an armed robber. You pretty much say you were kind of destined for this life of crime because that was the Trejo way. You know, that was what you guys knew. Everybody that I've known have always said, Danny, you have a lot of potential. My grammar school teacher. You have a lot of potential if you could just sit still. My my uh, my parole officer, you had a lot of potential. Just don't commit crimes. But he committed crimes throughout the 1960s and they landed him behind bars, including Folsom and San Quentin, where he spent time locked away in solitary and thought he was going to die. Following his uncle Gilbert led him to prison, but his advice and teachings also helped Danny survive there. You know, your family members taught you survival skills. Outside of the house, on the street, in prison, you know, what were some of them and how did you apply them to a life outside of crime? My uncle started me boxing when I was like eight, nine years old. I could always fight. When he started me boxing, that meant that every institution I went to, I was I was lightweight and welterweight champion. So, so I could automatically, automatically had a status. You know, I had I had a certain status. So so the, the penitentiary was still an insane place, but I, I survived again through, you know, being able to fight. While inside, Danny met Charles Manson. Everybody has this image of Charles Manson. Charles Manson was like five foot five. I couldn't see him doing what he did he even had a piece of string for a belt. He didn't even have a belt. He was like a hippie kid. I mean, even though he'd been in in, in and out, he, he wasn't like a, I don't, know, I don't want to call myself a gangster, but he, he wasn't like a gangster. He wasn't like a thug, you know? And so, so the people were going to take advantage of him. And we found out that he could hypnotize you. So we brought him into our wing, three of us. First, he got us loaded on weed, and that was fun. You know, you got somebody to get you loaded on weed, and you would actually get loaded. Hey, can you get us loaded on heroin? And he said, sure. But that was my experience with Charlie. I, I, I wasn't, I, you know, I wasn't impressed. He says a miracle happened. He was looking at the death penalty for his alleged involvement in a prison riot. But as it turned out, the prosecution did not have enough evidence. I knew I was a drug addict. I knew I was an alcoholic and I knew I was an armed robber and a pillion. I honestly believe that the good Lord, I made a deal with him. I said, you know what? If you let me die with dignity, I will say your name every day and I will do what I can for my fellow inmate. And I said inmate because I never thought I was getting out of prison. And so it was almost like the good Lord said, okay, 
let's see what you got. I got out of prison August 23rd, 1969. And I haven't looked back I, 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 and I've kept my deal. My morning prayers are, dear Heavenly Father, let me do whatever I can for my fellow man and I'll mention your name all day. And that's what I do. Danny also marks August 23rd, 1969 as the date when he got sober. Once out of prison, he began working with others to help guide them on that same path. We feed the people dogs and feed the homeless and whatever. That's the only way that I have found that you can stay out of prison, get rid of drugs and alcohol, and do what you can for your fellow man. And it says it, good things will come to pass. After prison, Danny started working with programs around Los Angeles, helping others get sober. In the middle of one night, after getting a frantic call from someone working as an extra pleading for his help to stay sober, he went searching for the guy on a movie set. The director saw him and asked him if he wanted to be in the film. He said yes, and that is how Danny Trejo entered his second act. Honest to God, everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else, everything. I was trying to be an extra. I met a kid that took me to this one film ran into a guy named Eddie Bunker. And uh, Eddie, again, boom, all of a sudden, me and him just became best friends. And all of a sudden, I was an actor. You know, I got cast as a boxer in a movie called Runaway Train with John Boyd and Eric Roberts. I haven't looked back. I played inmate number one. I played bad guy. I played Chicano dude with tattoos. That I never had a name the first, I think, five years of my career until I did a movie called uh, Penitentiary 3 with Leon Isaac Kennedy. I, I, would play, I was severe and I actually had a name. And then the next time I was in the film with a name, it was with Charles Bronson. Hey, don't I know you from someplace? I didn't even play Mexican. I played Italian. I was, yeah, buddy. Yeah, really. I was, uh, Art Sanella, I got to get blown up by Charles Bronson. What's your absolute favorite role that you got to play? Well, Machete. I would have loved the movie Machete, even if I wasn't in it. I was the lead in that. But when we did Heat, there's cops all over me, man. They're on me like a cheap suit. I, I got to play with Robert De Niro, and Michael Mann had done a film called uh, The Jericho Mile in Folsom. So when he saw me, first he said, hey, Gilbert, because that was my uncle's name. He knew Gilbert from Folsom when he did The Jericho Mile. And we started talking, and he could not get Gilbert out of his mind when he saw me. So if you see heat, my name in heat is Gilbert Trejo. Oh, wow. What are you working on? World's smallest camera. I have heard, look, mommy, the man from Spike is in 50 different languages. Every airport there'll be a, and still, he, he made these movies timeless because I have five-year-old kids showing up, you know, uh, Uncle Machete from Spike Kids. You're our uncle? A real uncle? Because I got fake uncle. The biggest thrill that I've ever had because of the movies is on, on Halloween, kids will come to the door and they'll be dressed like Machete with their little painted mustaches and, and who are you? Hi, Machete, you know. Oh, God. <laughs> the best feeling, especially, you know, as a person of color, we don't see Mexican superheroes. We don't see black superheroes that often. This is only now coming into the public consciousness. How does that make you feel? You could have never imagined that. You know, it, it's funny because uh, the biggest feeling is when I go to juvenile halls and I go to youth authorities and I go to prisons. But I, I was in a, it was a Dallas airport one time and I was standing there. This kid is look staring at me. And uh, him and his little wife and kid came over and said, Danny, I want to thank you. I heard you talk in juvenile hall and it changed my life. And this, you, you know, it's hard not to, you, your lip almost starts quivering when, when you think like, man, you mean 
what I said made an impression? Yes. That's why I sign every autograph. I take every picture simply because it's, yeah, uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's just what a blessing to be able to make somebody's day. All right, all right. Tacos I've had. He sure does when he pops up on customers at Trejo's Tacos or Trejo's Donuts. I, I like making people happy. And it's like when I show up, it kind of gives them a smile. Some of them say, what are you doing here? I said, what are you talking about, man? I'm enjoying myself, you know. You're 77 and you, and you got the fire still burning inside you to keep going. And I hope you don't stop. But now do you feel like the pieces are back together in your hole? Or you still feel like you're broken? No, I, I I feel I feel whole and I feel free, but I think right now I'm kind of dedicating the rest of my life to my kids. Dad. I'm 77 and a lot closer to the end than I am the beginning, so I'm just living it out. Whatever happens, happens. What's something that we don't know about you? What, what's a fun fact? I want a couple of fun facts about Danny Trejo. I got five dogs. I love them. And <laughs> anytime I leave the house and I come back, I throw myself on the floor and we have a lickle fest. I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I hope that it's the dogs and it's like not Danny Trejo. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> what's your advice to people now that feel stuck or feel that like, you know, they may have done something that like, oh, you know, like this is what they're going to be. Un- the reality is if if you think God it, it won't forgive you, with God on our side, nothing can hurt us. And, and I will say this, I would rather shoot for the moon and miss than aim for the gutter and make it. Only problem is a lot of us in society feel that, that the gutter is where we belong. And it's like, nah. This is Inside Edition Digital.